piece comes from. Mm -hmm. But now it is completely separate from that. It becomes something more of this aesthetic, uh, a little bit violent, but also very beautiful piece. Right. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that's this idea of like the slipperiness of the bondage and um, the rope having this kind of dual quality um, and the fact that people are now using them as not now for the last you know twenty years have been using them that it does it, that these like images sort of get woven in and out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that the piece we are talking about we're tentatively calling codex because like a codex it is meant to be sort of read. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I think of it as a way to almost read like my work. Like a pictograph, kind of. It's a pictograph. I mean, you can read it in relationship to the image I described, but you could also look at it as a way of reading how I'm trying to work right now, mm -hmm. of really twisting and abstracting these images to see if they still hold their power or if they create a new dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of this is, as I mentioned, I was joking when I said therapy, but it's, it's also true. I think because of the age I am, I'm on the cusp of the younger generation that isn't as burdened by some of this history and pathology. They're products of the pathology, but they're not necessarily yeah. um, knowledgeable about that burden. Well, I think we talked a lot, when we had our residency, we talked a lot about the idea of memory and what our, uh, those of us that are getting a little bit out of our 20s, um, I talked about what, you know, what it is that the next generation needs to or should sort of carry with them and we talked a lot about the idea of slavery of um, lynching mm -hmm. but we also but I, I think since our discussions there's this idea of, of minstrelsy and blackface and I think that's a really interesting one because I don't know if you asked a lot of people if if you asked them why blackface is um, insulting or you know what's so un PC about it I, I think that half of the people that we would ask wouldn't really know where that stems from. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because it's still kind of a powerful image, mm -hmm. but you know, we were talking about these um, University of San Diego kids who mm -hmm. had this Compton themed mm -hmm. party and some of them came in blackface and mm -hmm. the school, I was uh, visiting, a friend of mine works in the PR department at UCSD and, or CSD and it, the school was, you know, like mm -hmm. the Black Student Union and the Latino Student were like, there's not enough professors on campus. Like it sort of unleashed this sure. kind of thing. But I don't know if people really understand why these things that have, you know, such uh, harrowing mm -hmm. um, histories around them and mm -hmm. events, uh, do they carry on? And I think, like with blackface, that is something that still is an entertainment. Mm -hmm. And, um, not, not literal blackface, but the sort of well, uh, like you know, like uh, exaggeration of models, you know, in the Tyra Banks oh, yeah. show, you know, like it's still kind of in. Yeah, but in I mean, the I mix. think blackface is not. I mean, let's just say minstrelsy. We want to say blackface, but reality TV is minstrelsy, and it's fair game. Everybody's on those shows. It's mm -hmm. not limited to one group or another. I mean, these people are very willing to exploit themselves and even exaggerate themselves. Yeah, and I find that to be pretty much the same thing. Um, it doesn't, it's not so much victimization as blackface minstrelsy was, because the history of blackface minstrelsy is directly related to American musical theater, where um, early American musical theater made these plays to mimic and ridicule mm -hmm. slaves, or at this point, recently freed slaves. Mm -hmm. And as you remember, it was white actors dressed in blackface, and then later black actors in, in blackface black because you know the genre was just so successful <clears throat> so there really was a victimization there I think um, now it's so ingrained I think in, in entertainment that it's not one person doing it to another person everyone is totally complicit in this mm -hmm. and you know everyone's willing to be part of it mm -hmm. I mean we were talking about celebrity rehab last night <laughs> and I don't know if you consider that mental see or not but somebody is signing away saying you can catch me at my worst my on most TV, vulnerable my most vulnerable on TV right. as long as I get a check and possibly get a spin off right. so I mean people are more than willing to exploit themselves it's true I think that I mean I think that a lot of what I've learned through through your work is um, not, you know, and I hope that what people will get from coming to the show and from looking at your work is that what you think you think 
is not what you think. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like mm -hmm. um, some of the ideas that one has been told or one has learned in school um, that you kind of hold as, I mean, you don't really sort of critique in any way because you think that they are what they are, like slavery, bad, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? These, these ideas um, that there's so much more nuance to the way that sure. life is and ideas of complicity and um, well, you, you pain remember, and pleasure. Africans sold slaves to the Europeans. Right. So, you know, the Europeans just, you know, monopolized it and internationalized it. That right. was already happening right. in Africa with Africans against Africans. Mm -hmm. And that's just Africa. It's happening in every other you know, continent. Mm -hmm. It's part of our nature. That's sort of what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. Our nature is to do these things. Mm -hmm. There's a power dynamic. Everybody will at some point victimize somebody else. Mm -hmm. That's just what we do. We're animals that way. Mm -hmm. Can you, um, t since if this is sort of like a nature thing, let's let's go, let's project, and let's project into Afrofuturism, which is a subject that we have talked a lot about, and that kind of plays in, especially with some of the sort of more um, sort of constellation motifs that have that, but that's kind of filtered in and out of your work, and it certainly appears a little bit in the catalog. Mm -hmm. um, talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Just give our audience here um, mm -hmm. maybe a summary of of what that is. And I remember you you gave me that really. I think before you talk about that, one of the things that has been really great about working at a alternative art space like CAF is that it has enabled um, a process that isn't about like I come to your should I come to your studio and select some work and then bring it and then it sort of becomes part of the canon mm -hmm. but that this that this exhibition is really the result of multiple discussions and um, sort of the ideas that I bring to the table and the ideas that you bring to the table and how that can be um, used for the audience and used for different things so I say that because when we talk about Afrofuturism you pointed me to a really great essay by Mike Right. The music critic. Oh, great, 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 Kate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who talked a little bit about that. So mm -hmm. um, that was an aside. Yeah, um, and actually, I, I met the woman who was accredited with creating the term, um, Andre Nelson, a few weeks ago at my lecture at Columbia. Oh. She is a professor there. Huh. Um, <clears throat> and she's from the West Coast. But um, Afrofuturism, as I can best describe it, is a new field of research that is not really totally defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which makes it interesting. Um, and But it is influenced by the notion of looking at the African diasporic experience through the lens of science fiction. If you consider the trajectory of Africans selling Africans to Europeans all the way through minstrelsy, all the way to Obama, this is a surreal experience. And it's not in a vacuum that just happened to black people. It's sure. happened to you know. Okay. So... Another way of understanding this, instead of looking at history, which is, you know, which is the document of the quote-unquote winners and victors, and also his story, if you look at it through another lens, once again, and try to define this through the surreality of it, maybe we have a way of looking at the past and creating a different future. And not maybe, but we definitely have it. Oh, sorry, is that my phone? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they did text back then. Tubs. Tubs. <laughs> anyway. Um, Okay, so um, Afrofuturism. That was an Afrofuturistic moment, right? That was hugely. <laughs> and Sanford, now I'd like to take some questions from our audience, if that's okay. That would be fantastic. Great. Okay. Kimberly from uh, our Twitter page. <laughs> Education budget cuts are becoming increasingly threatening to the arts. As an artist, why do you feel that art education and university art programs are important? Or are they? Mm. Art education and university programs. We should say that Sanford is a professor at Columbia. Yeah. I, and uh, was recently at Virginia. Virginia Commonwealth University. And was also at Harvard, so he knows a little bit about it. And visiting scholar at Harvard last year. Um, it's a weird situation. I think art education is very important. University programs, hmm.